Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Spamanda Brian Flongo from the Democracy Development Program. I am the Senior Programs Officer for the Democracy Development Program and will just be doing a brief overview of our work for today. This uh, three-part half-day conference is held um, in respect of the nature and state of local government um, at the moment. As we see, our title of our, of our event is Local Government Crisis, How Can It Be Fixed? Um, and essentially what we're trying to do is have conversations around what it means for effective citizen participation ahead of the uh, 2021 local government elections. Um, for the purposes of today, we want to try and engage a variety of stakeholders uh, within the space um, to discuss probably f uh, some of these outcomes. Firstly, what are the implications of the Auditor General's report on the functioning of municipalities, accountability and transparency in public institutions? What are the implications of your vote as a citizen um, for 2021's local elections for the survival of local municipalities and their fiscal responsibilities? And further, what are the critical participation mechanisms, particularly for NGOs? And we want to try and look at the role specifically of NGOs in, in keeping um, the status quo or moving to a place where we actually recognize um, what our key uh, areas of, of intervention are. Um, we also want to try and, and speak to the revived role of, of municipalities in order to get out of the, the debt spiral, um, how to recover revenue lost to corruption and maladministration, um, and also to challenge um, um, to, to address what are the challenges for opportunities and reform and what the uh, future of municipalities looks like. In order to have this discussion, we have key st um, speakers or over the next sort of three hours or so who will be engaging with us in a variety of, of matters. Um, just for your knowledge, the engagement itself has um, uh, uh, three uh, parts. This is the first part where we're specifically looking at um, the, the status quo, um, where it relates to public administration and service delivery. Um, I'll be handing over to our moderator, um, Dr. Dirk Brand. Um, Dr. Dirk Brand is an extraordinary senior lecturer at the School of Public Leadership in Stellenbosch University. Um, he himself is an LLB, LLM, and uh, LLD, uh, um, so he's a doctor in law, constitutional law, and is an admitted, admitted advocate of the High Court of South Africa, and an independent legal um, a consultant. He has published various articles and contributions um, uh, on various, uh, on, to books on constitutional law, governance, and international relations. I would like to, on behalf of the Mail and Guardian, the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, and the Executive Director of the Democracy Development Program, to welcome you to participate. Please make sure that you comment and engage in our chat section so that the speakers can um, refer to your questions when they have an opportunity. But also, we will be launching a, a, a poll later on in our session, and we encourage you to participate in that poll so that we can also gauge your view um, on the current state of local government and how we can start to engage this. Um, Dr. Doug Brand, um, welcome and enjoy. Thank you, Brian. Uh, it's always nice to participate in your webinars. Uh, thank you for organizing this uh, today together with Mail and Guardian. And good morning to our two panelists and everybody that joins us uh, this morning. I hope that we will have an interesting and fruitful discussion when we talk about local government in crisis, uh, it is something that really affects all of us everywhere, irrespective of where from where you join in this webinar, you live within a municipality and there is some relationship between you and the administration in the sense of services that they provide or should provide to you and uh, you as a consumer that has uh, to pay have to pay for that. So. Local government in crisis is something which affects all of us and we need to find solutions. And if we look at the objects of local government in the constitution, I often wonder why is it so difficult to achieve those objects? It's very clear uh, what the role of local government in the country is and how it should involve uh, the community in engaging in local government issues but somehow we struggle and we don't get this right. Um, and there's a series of failures 
as the Auditor General's reports, not only the last one, but the previous few years, have pointed out um, to be. Um, and I think, therefore, it is very important that we have this discussion today and to guide us uh, for engaging in these issues. We have two excellent speakers, which I will introduce to you quickly. Aubrey Machiki, independent political analyst. Uh, he was previously a senior researcher um, at the Center for Policy Studies in Johannesburg and also at the Helen Sussman Foundation. And he is very knowledgeable about public governance issues and also about local government. Welcome, Aubrey. And then Kavisha Pillay, um, who is the head of stakeholder relations and campaigns at Corruption Watch, um, a non governmental organization. Kavisha is a social justice activist responsible for managing diverse work streams, which include collection of whistleblower reports, management of mass public mobilization campaigns, and overseeing anti corruption uh, programs of uh, Corruption Watch. So welcome to you as well, Kavisha, and uh, you have uh, both 10 minutes to make an introductory statement and thereafter we will have a Q&A session. So in the order that we uh, received, uh, it is first of all Aubrey and I hand over to you. Can we just unmute yourself? Aubrey, you're still muted. Am I back? Yes, there I hear you now. Okay. Tolazan. Um in nineteen eighty four, some councillors were killed by members of uh, the community in the Val Triangle. Six, some of the people who were convicted uh, were sentenced to death. In fact, since of, six of them were sentenced to death. A few years after uh, those councillors were killed in the Val Triangle, um Kontoesizwe launched an attack in Soweto with the aim of destroying the buildings of what was known then as the Urban Bandu Council. The point I am making is that there is a time in South Africa that there is a very strong antipathy and resistance to not only apartheid rule in general, but also to apartheid rule as it manifested at local level. And therefore, those black people who were part of the apartheid local government system were regarded as sellouts. Hence, the decision by members of the community in the VAR uh, to resist in a manner that led to the killing of these councillors who were regarded as sellers. And also hence the decision by Mkonto Asize to attack this building of the Urban Bantu Council. Now, of course, this resistance to how apartheid manifested at local level was to the fact that the local government system under apartheid was iniquitous. There were inequalities in the level and quality of uh, service delivery to black communities as compared to white communities. There were spatial inequalities and other anomalies of uh, apartheid local governance. But more importantly, not every South African citizen, unlike what we have today, 
fell within the ambit, ambit of local governments. Because unlike today, we did not have wall-to-wall -wall local governance in South Africa. We must also look at local government today in terms of what was desired. What was desired is local governance, local government, a local state that would deliver at local level social, economic, and other conditions that would be the antithesis of what existed during apartheid. In other words, through local government, what would be achieved are the goals of a non-racial, non-sexist, and prosperous South Africa. It is therefore not surprising that what you find in the Constitution can be summarized in terms of two broad mandates. There is a developmental mandate for the post-apartheid local government sector. There is also uh, the principle of decentralization. So in other ways, you can, you can summarize the position of local government in terms of an entity that exists to promote firstly development and secondly to do so in a decentralized manner. Now, when you look at what was desired as the goals of local government and the reality that uh, is experienced by citizens today, you may come to certain conclusions. The first conclusion is that yes, on paper, if you look at the constitutional framework, the leg legislative framework, the regulatory framework, and the policy framework, local government should deliver a nirvana of uh, prosperity, a nirvana of social and economic development within the local state and therefore at local government level. Or you can come to another conclusion that to the extent that there is always a gap between words and what they mean, the words contained in the constitution, in legislation, in regulations and in uh, policy are not matched by the reality that citizens are exposed to at local government level. In other words, local government is failing to deliver on the promise of a developmentalism and the promise of decentralized or a decentralized developmental agenda. But you may come to another conclusion, that to the, to the extent that local government is failing, municipalities are failing to deliver on what is promised in the constitution. It may be because the authors of the constitution were idealistic, or if it was not them who were idealistic, it is us as citizens who were idealistic because we did not take into account the material conditions under which local government would have to deliver on its developmental mandate, particularly when it comes to social and economic development. One of the material conditions that I believe we did not take into account sufficiently is the economy. That if you look at the areas in which those are victims of apartheid colonialism live. In many cases, there is either no economic base or the economic base is quite narrow. In each case, there is a mismatch between what is expected of those municipalities, particularly district and local municipalities, and what is promised 
because of the dearth of uh, resources available to those municipalities. So it is quite possible that, yes, we can blame the underperformance of municipalities on corruption. We can blame it on the dearth of skills such as financial management. We can blame it on political a lack of political will. But it is also possible that even if we're to find a cure for all that, that cure would not be sufficient to address the reality of communities that are located in areas where there is either no economic base or the economic base is too narrow for the local state to deliver on its promise or what is promised in the constitution and elsewhere. And what this brings me to, therefore, is whether there isn't a need to recalibrate our understanding of the position of the local state, especially with regard to its participation in national and provincial developmental programs. In other words, isn't there a need to look afresh at whether the economic resources available to the local state are in concert with our, with our uh, expectations as, as citizens and whether they are in concert with what the constitution expects the local state to deliver. And therefore, it is not going to be enough next year for citizens to vote or not to vote for a particular organization based only on what is true, yes, the fact that the local state is underperforming. Probably and that's your 10, the fact ten that minute signal. So you can conclude, please. Uh, it will be enough for citizens when they vote next year to base who they vote for only on the lack of political will, only on the problem of uh, corruption, only on what is true. And what is true is the fact that there is a lack of certain critical skills such as financial management. But citizens must lodge a, a discussion, a conversation about how to cure the mismatch between the resources available to the local state and what the constitution expects it to achieve. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much for that uh, input, Aubrey. And we'll certainly come back to the issue of recalibration, which I find interesting. Um, Kavisha, uh, we know about the problems, and uh, there's been many attempts by Cocta, for example, to send in um, so-called firefighting teams uh, or interventions to solve problems. Uh, capacity building is continuously happening within local government. Um, but what about civil society? Is, is part of the solution uh, in co-creating new ways of doing things in civil society. You're working for an NGO within society, so maybe you can share some ideas with the with our audience. Thanks, Dr. Brandt. And I, I think that um, you and Aubrey have provided quite a good context in terms of the vulnerabilities of local government to corruption. And in reviewing the whistleblower reports that Corruption Watch has received um, from across the country, you'll notice that What's happening at local government is no different to what's happening and occurring across all tiers of government, um, including our state-owned enterprises. But because local government is at the coal face of service delivery, you find that there is a greater, it has a harsher and more adverse impact on ordinary people across our country. And there's, despite, you know, big grand corruption that's occurring at our state-owned enterprises at a national level, 
people are still more distrustful of local government than they are in comparison to other tiers of government. And this was evident in a Transparency International survey called the Global Corruption Barometer, where South Africans rated the local government as the second most corrupt institution in the country coming after the South African Police Service. And again, uh, in a survey conducted by Corruption Watch this year, a youth perception survey, a, the same result was found where young people viewed local government to be the second most corrupt institution in our country. And essentially what this means, and Aubrey touched on this as well, is that corruption at a local government level essentially prevents the realization of our basic constitutional rights to accessing health, uh, sorry, housing and water and sanitation and others. It is a direct um, attack on our people and it also places a huge burden in terms of overcoming systemic inequality um, across, that is experienced across the country. So it is definitely an area where we should be getting involved in, uh, more involved in. It's definitely an area that requires a lot more attention and advocacy if we want to improve the lives of ordinary people in our country and restore dignity and um, address inequality. We have to work on fixing local government and the corruption that occurs there. I just want to touch on some of the whistleblower reports that Corruption Watch has received in relation to local government. Um, we've received over 31,000 whistleblower complaints since our inception in 2012. About 15% of these complaints relate to corruption at a local government level. Um, in terms of the types of corruption, 29% of these complaints relate to, to bribery, 19% of complaints uh, refer to procure procurement irregularities, 8% um, of complaints relate to abuse of power, usually at the hands of ward councillors, and a further 6% of complaints uh, um, relate to the embezzlement of funds. And where this corruption usually takes place and what we we have identified as hotspots is firstly the office of the municipal manager so about 32 percent of complaints um, originate or, or relate to this office and whistleblowers have indicated that officials and employees um, embezzle and mismanage funds that are meant for service delivery um, and development in communities so we've received a number of cases where tens of millions of rands have been squandered or misused that were meant to be directed towards the building of roads or the development of sporting and recreational facilities, houses, etc. Um, a second hotspot relates to the Metro Police Departments and um, as expected, rampant bribery um, on the roads as well as licensing centres. And then the last hotspot for us, um, according to the whistleblower reports, is in relation to the development of RGP houses and the allocation of these houses. And here whistleblowers have highlighted issues of abuse of power. So especially female whistleblowers have often encountered um, sextortion where they've had to exchange sex in, relay, um, in order to receive a house or even to be placed on a housing list. Um, there's also other um, instances of fraud and bribery, as well as the mismanagement of funds that were meant um, to go towards the development of these RCP houses. So in a nutshell, that's essentially what the, um, our reports are telling us and what whistleblowers have been saying in terms of how they are most exper or how they are experiencing corruption at a local government level. But to just also provide a little bit more um, context and example, you know, you see how corruption at this level usually, um, you know, impacts on, on, on our communities and our communities are punished. So if you look at what's happening with ESCOM, you know, shutting down municipalities and not providing electricity, you know, in a number of these cases, ordinary people have been paying their tariffs. These, this money has been misused, not going to ESCOM. ESCOM then takes it out on communities across the country. Um, you know, we received a report recently about how um, th th there's a woman uh, in Deep Slut who was talking about um, you know, money that was meant to go towards the construction of a road. Um, and, you know, Aubrey again touched on this about spatial apartheid. People are living far away from their, their jobs, living far away from their schools. Um, roads are not being managed properly, and this now adds an extra burden of time just to get to a place of, of work or a place of learning. Um, you know, the impact on young people where money that was meant to go towards sporting facilities or social and recreational facilities being squandered. Um, and then, leading 
um, sort of young people, especially in a lot of uh, sort of vulnerable communities who experience crime and, um, you know, high levels of gangsterism and so on, leads them towards these antisocial activities because that's a sort of space of belonging. And, you know, I think what has been most disturbing during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, yes, there's been lots of, you know, corruption in relation to procurement that we've heard about, but devastatingly, we've received so many reports about the theft and misuse of um, food parcels, where whistleblowers were telling us about having to pay five grand in order to, to access a food parcel or that food parcels were only being distributed based on a system of patronage. So you can see that the direct impact in relation to local government does hinder our access to basic human rights um, and, and dignity. So, you know, Dr. Brand, going to your question about civil society and what we should be doing, you know, I think, you know, a large reason for why corruption occurs at the level that it does at, a lo at local government is because of a lack of accountability. You know, NGOs such as Corruption Watch and others, as well as the media, is usually largely focused on what's happening at a national level. Um, even sort of the public interest litigation that goes on is usually directed towards national departments. There's very little oversight over what's going on at a local level, and this then creates an environment where um, officials act with a sense of impunity and nobody is really being held accountable. But what we should be doing as, as civil society in the run up to the elections, again, as Aubrey mentioned, is not just about getting people to vote, it is not enough. You want to make sure that people know how to you know, continue to participate in our democracy beyond just casting a ballot. You know, you want people to be able to know how to hold their ward councillors accountable. Um, and what we should be doing and advocating for is open door municipalities, where municipalities should be making information that is in the public interest Pub, you know, available. And, you know, we should be advocating for the publication of budgets and expenses and urban plans and council meeting minutes and audit reports and contracts and asset declarations. And again, anything that is within the public interest and that information should be, you know, where feasible, it should be open to commentary and feedback. But what we should also be um, advocating for is to make sure that municipalities have safe disclosure platforms where and there's an environment for whistleblowing. I mean, we know at the moment that there is a genuine fear for uh, blowing the whistle on corruption because of the consequences that people face, you know, and we need to make sure that people who in terms of creating an environment that's conducive for whistleblowing, you know, the, uh, we should be ensuring that whistleblowers have access to um, you know, legal resources and advice um, to psychological services as well as financial services. And, you know, that will then encourage others to come forward so that they know they do have that support. Um, but other things that civil society can focus on is definitely, there's a definite need for citizen awareness in public education. People need to know how they can get involved in their local government and how they can be holding people accountable. But we, we, Beyond that is, you know, creating frameworks for social audits, community scorecards and citizen report cards. And, you know, the, these at, sometimes do seem like shallow initiatives, but they're a first step in just making sure people are constantly vigilant and aware of what's happening at that space. Um, I see that my, my time is running out. So, you know, just to wrap up and we will be able to probe some of these discussions in the question and answer session, you know, Whilst corruption is the greatest enemy to the people, I think the greatest enemy to corruption is an active and mobilized and aware public. Um, and, you know, the problems of corruption are so layered and complex, but I, I still think it is, um, it, it's not impossible for us to overcome. So, it, you know, in that spirit, I think we constantly need to be striving for and fighting for a corruption free society and, you know, working with various stakeholders, we need to be able to put proper, um, you know, initiatives in place so that we can finally realize this. Um, thanks, Dr. Brand. I'll end there for the moment. Thank you very much, Kavisha. You very much on the uh, button there on the time limit. I appreciate that. Uh, I like the idea of an open door municipality and the activities that you associate that clearly that could be an important contribution to building that culture of accountability and in fact strengthening accountability. Um, we have uh, 
also a poll running, and I, I think the audience have noticed that. Uh, let me just um, quickly indicate the question again. What do you think is the biggest contributor to poor performance at municipal level? And then there's a couple of options. Insufficient management and oversight, poorly qualified and experienced staff, no political will for reform, and cater deployment, or all of the above. And you can still um, contribute to the poll. Um, and then I think we can look at some of the questions that came in. Um, let me just look. There's a couple of questions. Um, I just want to have a look here quickly. Arvin Bola asked, there are enough pieces of legislation available uh, presently, in my opinion, citizens are not using them. Um, so, is that correct? Do we have sufficient legislation or do we have too much legislation? Uh, can we use that better? Uh, maybe some comments from our panelists. Anyone? Uh, Kavisha, uh, Aubrey? I'll, I'll defer to Karisha, then I'll follow. Okay, good. Um, I do I do agree with, with Alvin, I think, who said that, because we do have sufficient legislation. In fact, we have quite good anti-corruption legislation in the country. Um, the the difficulty is, you know, the, the enforcement and the, uh, we also have good anti-corruption policies. So uh, as some of you might know, there's a local government anti-corruption strategy. There's a national anti-corruption strategy that's due to be launched quite soon. A, a huge issue has just been the political will around the implementation of, the, of, of these um, policies. Um, and we also know, I mean, over the last few years, we did see um, an issue in relation to law enforcement being um, under capacitated, being held out and then not being able to sufficiently direct resources towards um, dealing with what's been going on in, in the local government level. Um, and I'm just going to use this opportunity to raise that there's be recently been a formation called the Local Government Anti-Corruption Forum, um, which is modeled on what is called the Health Sector Anti-Corruption Forum, which is a multi-sector stakeholder body that includes law enforcement agencies, civil society organizations, as well as a few private bodies who come together to deal with a number of these issues from a investigative perspective as well as from a prevention perspective. But yes, we do have good legislation, we have good policies in place, the difficulty around it has been implementation. Um, but also from, you know, looking at another a comment that was posted in terms of civic participation, there's also been a lot of um, uh, products and public education material that's been developed around how to get involved in local government, but it doesn't have a, a big penetration. So I guess from a civil society perspective, you know, our job is really about making sure that all of this public education material and rights training um, is, is scaled up and that a lot of people across the country are able to access this information and um, and then being able to hold the local municipalities or local ward councillors to account. Thanks, Kavisha. Aubrey? Well, what you must bear in mind is that uh, the citizen um, or the experience of the citizen is with the impact of policy in his or her lived reality. And for me, there are two problems, or maybe more, but I'll highlight two. Um, first of all, we have many policies. Some might even say we have many good policies. And my response to that always is, if the ANC is correct in saying it has good policies, the pro problem is implementation. How is that which is not implemented good? How can we know it is good? And I think the citizen has a very eloquent answer because the citizen does not come into contact with the policy. The citizen comes into contact with the failure to implement the policy or comes into contact with the weaknesses of uh, the policy. So it seems to me 
to the extent that policies are populated by many words, and to the extent that, as I said, words are not what they describe, the challenge for the citizen is, a, is demonstrable evidence that the state is beginning to bridge the gap between words and what they describe. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the other challenge is to find new words. Okay, thank you, uh, Aubrey. Um, there are some questions which I want to combine here. The one relate to the IDP, uh, the Integrated Development Plan, which is the primary development tool or planning tool for municipalities and which per definition must involve citizens. The question is, uh, is that not a sufficient tool to involve citizens to find solutions? And together with that, the issue of monitoring the performance of municipalities. Um, is, it, is it possible to include citizens more in the monitoring of the performance of municipalities? Uh, do we need different tools for that matter? Kavisha, want to take a shot at that? Yeah, I'll try. Um, so in terms of, I'll start with the monitoring question first is that the difficulty, I mean, we have promotion of access to information, the promotion of access to information act PIA, um, which at the time when it was uh, developed was, um, you know, very welcomed and uh, it, it was quite progressive, but in 2020, it's no longer fit for purpose, given that we are in this sort of digital world, um, accessing information now becomes a sort of long and drawn out process. What should, re what should be required in order for monitoring is that there has to be a, a proactive release of information from municipalities. So usually government departments, in order to deter and frustrate um, members of the public, is that they use fire and it takes long periods of time in order to access this information. Um, and then, you know, at the end, they just either become non-responsive or at the end, they just, you know, decline your request. So we need to start looking at if we want to do proper monitoring, there has to be proper, you know, PIA has to be fixed so that um, we no longer having to wait for such long periods of time and that, you know, the public is no longer being frustrated by government departments who don't want to give, give this information. But I also think that, you know, without us having to go and ask for the information, in municipalities and government departments should proactively be, be putting out this information because it is in the public interest. I mean, we saw with COVID-19, the minute they started releasing these disclosure reports um, about, you know, where they've been, where Treasury was publishing, where the um, the money was going to, a lot of investigations started to unfold and you, you saw how useful it is when people actually have access to this information. So we need to ensure that we not not having to beg and knock on doors constantly to get information that you know the information will be provided to us and that then will help us with monitoring you know there's other sort of countries around the world in their local municipalities have developed a number of different types of online tools for monitoring purposes i don't know if we are there yet i mean i think the first thing is to get the information and then we can start talking about how that information becomes accessible um to to the mass public um in terms of public participation participation, there definitely are avenues where the public should be participating and what the most concrete um, you know, ways is in the appointment of the municipal manager. You know, this appointment process um, is an appointment that's made by, by, the, by the council and it should be transparent and it should be open for the public to be able to input. So at Corruption Watch, just to give you a bit of an example, we, we've um, since 2016 been participating and contributing towards the appointments of, um, of leaders in key positions such as, you know, the public protector and more recently the Auditor General and currently at the moment the National Lotteries Commission. And basically what we advocate for is that the process is transparent so everybody knows, this, you know, the CVs, for example, of who's applied for this, um, that it's open to public participation so that you can comment or object to candidates who are on the list and that it's based on merit. So it's not based on political patronage so that you're putting pliable people in place, but it's, you know, based on, 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 on a sort of good set of criteria that will ensure that you have the best possible candidate appointed. Municipal managers can be appointed in that way. There is room for it and there is 
um, there is room for the public to be able to participate in those types of processes. And I'm hoping that in the run up to the 2021 elections and, and post elections, we will be able to see a lot more transparency and participation in the appointments of these managers because we know and what's been evidenced in the Corruption Watch reports is that a lot of corruption happens in that office. So if the fish rots from the head, what we need to do is make sure that we put a good, um, we, we get good people and people with integrity in, in those offices to prevent the mass looting of money there. Thank you, Kavisha. Um, Aubrey, do you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah, on that? yeah. Um, the constitution talks not only about the imperative of uh, public participation. It talks about meaningful public, public participation. And in my view, meaningful participation uh, starts with the citizen being uh, the policy initiator. And in too many cases, in the interaction between uh, government at different levels and the citizen, the citizen is not the policy initiator. For instance, when it comes to IDPs, in too many cases, the IDPs come to the citizen as a, as a fait accompli. And therefore, what needs to change is the model in the, that governs the relationship between the citizen and, uh, let's say, local government in this case. We, we, we can either do what we are doing now, uh, be governed by the service delivery model, which is akin to a patient-doctor model. In other words, the citizen is the patient and the doctor of the state knows what to pre prescribe. And the citizen has very little input in what should be prescribed. Or you can, you can go for an empowerment model in which you treat the citizen, as I said, as a policy initiator that the citizen participates in the process leading up to the adoption of the IDP so that the IDP doesn't come to the citizen um, as a fait accompli. Because in work that I did with uh, Ibrahim Fakir some years ago with the communities of uh, uh, Balfour and uh, Deep Slot, those communities mm -hmm. would say to us, if we go to an IDP meeting, and the plans that are presented to us are impressive, but are not in concert with uh, what we need, or to the extent that they address what uh, we need. They are not as high in our hierarchy of their needs as we want them to be. Or you can go um, to a third model. It can be an intermediary uh, model where you strike a, a healthy balance um, between the citizen being a policy initiator and the state having the resources and uh, expertise and acting in good faith to inform the choices of the citizen. Thank you very much, Aubrey. Uh, I think you're right there. That meaningful public participation is clearly uh, indicated in the Constitution uh, and it must be given effect to. And where we failed to uh, create a good voice for citizens and platforms to engage with that, that need to be corrected. One of the comments on the chat indicate that post-COVID-19 certainly uh, should involve citizens much more uh, creatively and, and innovatively. Um, that's perhaps one of the things that the COVID crisis indicated that um, you need to find new ways of working across traditional silos or borders and involve communities in finding solutions to fight this pandemic. Uh, and maybe we could uh, apply that to other um, parts of the municipal service delivery as well. Uh, you made a comment earlier on in your presentation, Aubrey, about recalibration of uh, the model. Um, and I was wondering, uh, is it time after 20 odd years of uh, the designed local government model that we re-look or review the design 
um, uh, to try and cure the problems uh, or can we fix it with some of the solutions that uh, were mentioned this morning in, in creating new ways for the community to be involved um, constructively? Well, let me just briefly go back to the earlier question of monitoring and evaluation. Um, when, when I was in government, I, I, I used to argue that integrated development and delivery uh, must be treated as a skill that resides in the state. And I used to argue that the same applies to monitoring and evaluation because what tended to happen there and then and what tends to happen now um, is that those doing the monitoring and evaluation, uh, yes, maybe academically highly qualified, but to rely in the main on reports that are sent to them about the performance of this or that part of the state, which to me is woefully inadequate. Because for me, the goal must be uh, the state developing the capacity to monitor and evaluate almost in real time and being able to intervene almost in real time with the technological advances avail available to us. There would therefore be a need for citizens to gain access to that technology and the state to use that technology to make sure that it can monitor, evaluate and intervene almost in uh, real time. Do we need to recalibrate um, the model? My idea on this is quite uh, inchoate. What, what is very clear to me is that whether there is a design uh, problem or not, there is definitely a mismatch uh, between the capacity of uh, many municipalities um, and what they are expected to deliver. So it seems to me the first thing that we must recalibrate is the expectation. And the second thing therefore we must do is to align the expectation to the resources um, available uh, to these municipalities that are underperforming. And, and yes, corruption is a, um, is a big problem. Uh, in fact, I do believe that corruption is not endemic anymore. I think corruption is systemic, it's the dominant culture um, in the state and became as such uh, during the presidency of uh, Jacob Zuma. But I struggle personally to engage in a conversation about the recalibrating uh, the, the, the model of the local state without having a conversation about the, the most challenging problem in South Africa, which is that of inequality, and linked also uh, to the structure of our economy. There is an extent to which, unless you, you, you attend to the structure of our economy and you effect fundamental transformation of our economy, a hundred years from now, we will still be having conversations about the mismatch between the, the, the expectations and the capacity of uh, uh, municipalities, particularly in those areas where the economic base is either non-existent or is very narrow. Thank you for that uh, input, Aubrey. Um, Kavisha, do, would you like to comment on that? I, I think I'd just like to comment on, on the last part that Aubrey mentioned, which is very important in that, there is, because of inequality in our country, it's very difficult then for us to completely root out corruption. And, and it, it, we have to ask the question of what do we address first? Can we, you know, do we address issues of inequality and would that reduce corruption? Or if we reduce corruption, would that, or if we, we combat corruption, would that reduce inequality? And, you know, where it's evident again is, as I mentioned in the Global Corruption Barometer Survey that was done by Transparency International last year, the survey found that um, sort of poor people were much more likely to engage in corruption in comparison to other income groups. And it's not because poor people have no morals and, you know, they just think this is the way to go. It's often because you have no other choice. You know, so are you going to, you know, pay in order to 
or you often get put in a situation where you have to pay that 50 rand in order to get access to healthcare treatment or you are going to pay some money so that your ch your child can get an education or you are going to bribe so that you can get access to a house it's a problem that we have here and until we start dealing with these issues of inequality you know corruption seems like a viable way it's a way for for vulnerable people in order to get access to services i mean yes there is the problem of these services should be provided in the in the first place and i think it, it just becomes you know an issue it, it starts to make ours the corruption issue in south africa a lot more complex and a lot more layered because it's not just about greedy people wanting to engage in this it's often people who are just desperate for services who are also willing to engage in corruption and then therefore not necessarily you know coming to the anti-corruption party because the culture is that you have to pay for this in order to get that service um, and it is it is a serious problem and it is a conversation that I think we don't have enough in South Africa. I mean, we don't look as well, you know, speaking to what Aubrey was saying in terms of the economy. You know, we don't have that conversation about what motivates people to engage in corruption in the first place. You know, what, what are those reasons behind it? it? It surely just can't be about being greedy and wanting to take it all for yourself. Yes, that does play a huge factor, but it's not the only contributing factor to this. So I think a more nuanced discussion, um, we, 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 def we definitely at that point where we need to start having more nuanced discussions about corruption and not just sort of take it at face value mm -hmm. as a lot, of, a lot of the narrative around it has been for quite some time. Okay, thank you for that. I want to share the poll results uh, with you and with the audience quickly. Um, the question was, what do you think is the biggest contributor to poor performance at municipal level? And 21% indicated insufficient management and oversight, 4% poorly qualified and inexperienced staff, 4% no political will for reform, 2% cater deployment, and 66% all of the above. So, um, from that, one could gather that uh, there are quite a few clearly um, identified um, motivators or uh, indicators of poor performance in municipalities. And the question is, where do we find the solutions? Um, the theme of this uh, conference is trying to fix it. And hopefully we can get to a point where solutions emerges. Uh, it seems to me that in terms of today's discussion, definitely part of the answer lies in, uh, in the communities itself, in how we structure the involvement. Um, and in, I think two uh, comments from uh, each of the, our panelists uh, before we close. We have uh, another two, three minutes uh, for that. So um, I will give Aubrey a chance now and then Kavisha. Well, in, in, in my view, um, we, we need to deal with, when you look at the results of the survey, with the fact that the results of the survey uh, indicate two things. Uh, perceptions of performance um, at the subjective level of uh, the citizen, which may not be objective reality, by the way. Um, which means, therefore, what we need to examine quite closely is the interaction between this subjective perception and what constitutes objective reality for the citizen on the ground. Another thing that uh, needs to happen in in my view is is for us to make sure that citizens indeed can participate meaningfully in processes and civil society formations have a critical role to play in this regard and they can do this by designing tools that can be made available to citizens for them to interact with the local state, with the provincial state and the national state effectively, be able to inform the content of programs and be able to make 
those who are responsible for service delivery to account. Thank you, Aubrey. That's very interesting. You talked about co-creation uh, of solutions, which I like. Um, Kavisha, last comments from you. Yeah, I, I think that um, you know, just just furthering the, the comment on citizen awareness and participation, civil society definitely needs to be mobilized um, around the country and to be working with communities and grassroots organizations to develop these tools, to um, develop public education materials so that we can start um, really monitoring what's going on in local government and making sure that um, you know, our local officials are being held accountable. But I think another thing that needs to happen, and it's been happening more at a sort of national level with, um, you know, uh, sort of the bigger risks that have been going on, but we do need to start seeing, you know, proper, in a lot more investigations in local government, and we do need to start seeing um, local officials being held accountable for their actions. Um, and then we need to make sure that these the findings from these investigations are implemented, um, and that, you know, there's proper mm -hmm consequence management. I mean, year in and year out, you're getting, you know, the reports from the Auditor General and nothing is really changing across municipalities. It's actually getting worse than what it was a few years ago, according to the AG. So I think we, we there definitely needs to be a change in terms of consequence management um, and that we start reducing the culture of impunity that exists at local government level. Thank you very much to our uh, two panelists, Kavisha Pillay and Aubrey Machiki. And I hand it over to Brian. Well, um, what an exciting start. Thank you so much, uh, colleagues, for the uh, initial inputs into the session. I think the, the session was able to lay the groundwork for some of the really important discussions we need to emerge. We've already started talking here about sort of what are the things that we need to start doing to enrich the, uh, the ability of citizens to monitor and hold the local government accountable. One of the big things that we've engaged on in various fora with citizens is the idea that citizens don't have the ability, for instance, to recall their local government councillors and to, to what extent are they able then to, to actually say they can hold them accountable if that, that the ability to recall someone who's not performing, for instance, um, is one of the things that we start to engage on. So thank you very much to you, Dr. Dirk, to Aubrey for the insights that he was able to provide to us as well as to you, Kavisha, for your, your inputs, as well as the work that Corruption Watch does. I think um, civil society holds a very important role, um, or is rather a very important stakeholder in the various aspects of work that we do in, 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 in society. And one of the tools, for instance, that we've started seeing some civil society organizations doing is the idea of social audits. So creating opportunities for communities to participate in auditing of both the service delivery, but also the the leadership at, at, at municipal level as one of the mechanisms. Um, we, we know of partners such as Plan Act, um, such as um, uh, uh, Democracy uh, uh, DAG in Cape Town. We know of FSS Core Plan and um, um, IBP that do things such as social audits, which enrich the process of holding the government accountable. So thank you also to the participants who have been here with us. We just want to try and encourage you to grab a cup of coffee, um, some tea if you don't like coffee, or, or water um, and, and, and come back and join us for the next session at 11 a.m., which will be going through specifically um, a, taking a, a look at what is the, um, so based on our, our initial introduction now, what is then the, the aspects that pertain to public participation and political legitimacy? In that session, will be moderated by Monolo Mohale, who is uh, a, a, a program manager or a manager at the Center for, for, um, for Human Rights, which is an organization that's based in UP. Um, and then Kamani, um, the program officer um, at FSS Core Plan, will be speaking to us about the impact of COVID-19 on public participation at local government level. Um, and then we'll also hear from Nobu um, who will be speaking about the IOC's decision to postpone by-elections amid the pandemic um, and what that impact is on the political voice. We also want to encourage you to also join us for our third session, which will be starting at 12.15, which will be speaking to what does the road ahead look like, 2021 and beyond. So we're voting next year, then what does it mean? And in that, in that, in, in that in, uh, instance, we'll be speaking to um, oh, Mr. Dr. Isaac Kambule, um, who will be speaking about the district development model. What is this DDM that everyone is talking about? And, trying to improve local government outcomes, as well as um, Janet Love, who's the vice chairperson 
at the IEC, the Electoral Commission, will be speaking about voter civic education and elections preparedness um, amid COVID-19 recovery from the IEC's perspective. Thank you so much. The link for the next session is on the chat section. Um, the recording for this session, as well as the, the, the further sessions, will be sent to all delegates by tomorrow. Um, and we do look forward to seeing you again at 11 a.m. Once again, thank you for the speakers. Thank you on behalf of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, on behalf of um, uh, Maiden Garden, as well as on behalf of our executive director and staff at DDP um, for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Goodbye.